And my weekly exercise, running to the balcony to turn on the equipment, running to the sound room to turn on the equipment. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 26. Tonight is part three of Sailing Slow After Fast. And as you know, that's a play on words because the fast that's mentioned in the text here is Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. Sailing Slow After Fast, part three, Acts chapter 27, verses, excuse me, 26, 24 through 32. 27, 1 through 12. I've got two passages written down here. I want you to read you the right one. Acts 27. And it was determined that we should sail into Italy. They delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. And entering into a ship of Adramitium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coasts of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Canidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmone. And hardly passing it, we came to a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh unto where was the city of Lycia. Now, when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading of ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain unto Phoenice and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power for the opportunity that we have this evening to look into it so that you might use your word to penetrate our hearts, our thoughts and intents, the deep things that are there, things that are true and noble, but things that are wicked and perverse, that you might cause us to understand where we have sinned, that you might cause us to understand your will for our lives, that you might cause us to understand not only to understand, but to obey. Father, we thank you again for your word and pray for your blessings upon it tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall that last week we summarized what is going on here in the passage. The first week we looked at it in more detail. But we remember that this passage gives an illustration of a man who starts in unbelief and later believes the words of Paul in total contrast to Agrippa, whom we've studied in the previous chapter. We're given his name, just like Agrippa, one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. He's a kind man, according to verse 3. He's a pragmatist, rather than a man of faith, verse 11. He chooses to believe Paul later in a crisis situation when it really matters, but here he goes along with the crowd. Did you notice that? It says, because the haven was not commodious to winter, in verse 12, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain unto Phoenice. The right thing to do is not always determined by popular vote. Here they thought they were going to have a comfortable winter and instead they ended in shipwreck. How often in our lives are we motivated by popularity? What do other people think? How often are they going to push us in this direction and we don't really realize until we've already cast off anchor and we're in the middle of the sea and the storm hits. That's what's going on in our text here. We saw the principle of the sovereignty of God and work in eight ways, a specific ship, a time, a location, a centurion, a certain captain and band of soldiers, a specific destination, a specific group of passengers, and a specifically ordained storm. 
We saw that these same elements are always found in God's direction in our personal lives. Specific temporal items, like the ship that God is going to use in our lives. Specific timing, you're not here by accident at this point in history. Specific places, the thousands of places that you've been. Because God is sovereignly interweaving all events of history in such a way that it will bring him the greatest amount of glory. There are no irrelevant events, no worthless experiences if we view them from the divine perspective. For specific people who are going to make an impact on our lives. You know, God is using every person with whom you have ever come in contact to rub off your rough edges to conform you to the image of Christ. Specific people upon whom God will use us to make an impact. And we talked a great detail about how you will make some kind of an impact, no matter how small, on every person with whom you ever come in contact in your life. Because, you see, your life is ordered by God, so in the life of every person on the planet you have no accidental contacts with other people. So we ask the question, what kind of an impact have we made by what we said, what we did, the attitudes that we had, even to casual observers? Were we what Paul calls the living epistles known and read of all men? Six, the specific destinations and goals. That's the one we're going to continue to develop tonight. That deals with God's plan for your life. The specific will of God for your life right now. Do you know what it is? And finally, the specific supernatural events that cannot happen by chance when they're connected to everything else that's going on in our lives. There are things that happen in your life that cannot be explained in any other way than by supernatural intervention. And so we began to talk about that sixth element last week, the working of God in the life of every person, the specific destinations and goals that God has for each of our lives. In other words, what is the specific will of God for your life? As we mentioned last week, the fast that is spoken about in our text is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Yom HaKippur, if you're going to give it its full name, but Yom Kippur it's normally called. Required by God to be celebrated by the Jews on the 10th day of Tishri, the 7th month of the Jewish calendar, from sundown on the 9th until sundown on the 10th. I mentioned last week that the Jewish calendar doesn't exactly line up with our calendar. In the year that this happened, it was around October 1st. But this year, uh, 2016, it will be on October 12th. The Jewish calendar moves in relation to the solar calendar that we function on. So this year, Yom Kippur will be on October 12th. It's very dangerous to be sailing on the Mediterranean at that time of the year. And we made quite a few applications, as you recall, for that. Now, as I was checking over what I said last week, I think I gave the wrong impression that Yom Kippur is the same thing as Tisha B'Av. Oh, that's the ninth of Av, a Jewish month of Av. That's not what I meant to say, if you got that idea. I want to do a contrast, though, and compare Yom Kippur with Shab B'Av and the ninth day of the month of Av. It's very instructive, I think, to see that in light of the sovereign plan of God for Israel. Both of those are incredibly important days in the Jewish calendar every year. Yom HaKippur, or Yom Kippur as it's normally called today, was one of the divine festivals ordained by God. It was a day of fasting a day of special sacrifices that God required of the Jewish people. Rather interesting, we'll see in a moment the context in which that occurred. All the rest of the days of God, those special festivals, were days of feasting and joy. But Yom Kippur was a day of repentance, a day of mourning for sin. Later on, there were additional feasts that were added to the Jewish calendar, such as Purim, which was established, as you know, in the days of Esther and Mordecai in the book of Esther, but it was not originally given by God under the law. First, Yom Kippur, so that we'll understand the context in which all of this is happening, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, was given by God for two reasons. Now, most of us know the first reason. Perhaps the second reason is not so well known. But number one, it was to cover all the sins that had been committed during the year that had not been dealt with by the people, by the priests and even by the high priest. A special sacrifice had to be made for the high priest himself on Yom Kippur. But the second reason for Yom Kippur was that was the day upon which the year of Jubilee would be proclaimed. 
your freedom for all those people who had gone into bondage, all those people who had, had sold their possessions and sold their, their lands and their houses and, you know, the things that God had given to them as an eternal inheritance because they were members of a specific tribe and they had descended from the founders of that tribe. Back in the days of Joshua, when the land was divided up among the 12 different tribes, God said, it's going to belong to you forever. And if they were in debt, in bondage at that time, they were released. So Yom Kippur had some very positive aspects to it, as well as this business about repenting for sin. There were specific rules that God set for all of the activities that were to take place on that day. Leviticus 16 is the key passage dealing with it. It gives God specific instructions after God, ooh, after God killed Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron because they offered strange fire on the altar of God. In other words, they did a priestly ritual that was not specifically ordained by God. We like to make things up as we go along. I think there's been a lot of strange fire all offered on the altars of churches which have decided to get into the ways of the world and they've brought the things of the world into the church so that now they are like Nadab and Abihu offering strange fire upon the altar. Let me just remind you of that passage. That's back in Leviticus chapter 10, verse one and following. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon. So that seems to be okay, doesn't it? I mean, God ordained the censers. God told them to make those censers. And God told them that they are supposed to put incense in them and they're supposed to bring various offerings to the Lord. But they were doing it at a time and in a way that God had not commanded. They were adding something to his word. They offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. We like to do things for God, but it's perhaps not what God has said we should do. What happened? Verse 2. There went out a fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. They hadn't sanctified themselves before they came. They hadn't gone through what God told them to do before they came into his presence. I wonder how many of us, when we come to worship the Lord, have really prepared our hearts or we just sort of rush around at the last minute, come dashing out the door. We streak over to the church, mumbling and grumbling that we forgot something. Come rushing in, probably late. Plop down, don't have our minds in order for the worship service because we're thinking about all the things that were going on in the world around us. And But we know we're supposed to be there in church, so we just sort of try to settle down and we're not paying attention. They hadn't prepared themselves for appropriate worship. I think there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the church today. There's both the offering of strange fire and the non-preparation for the worship that God has commanded. It cost these guys their life. Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Two of his sons have just been burned by fire from God. And Moses called Mishael and el the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said unto Aaron and unto Eleazar and Ithamar his sons, those are the two sons who lived, uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. You think they were a little bit scared? I think so. Because it says, and they did according to the word of Moses. 
Now, when we get to the Day of Atonement, why did I mention that passage? Because when we get to God's instructions for the Day of Atonement, the fast that's going on here in Acts, we find that God directly connects it to the giving of the instruction for the Day of Atonement. Leviticus chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. That takes us back six chapters when they offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat which is upon the ark that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. You couldn't come in just with the right clothing. You couldn't come in just with the right utensils, such as the censers. You couldn't come in just with incense, although the altar of incense stood directly before the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. You had to come in with blood. You had to come in with blood. And it had to be specific blood that was ordained by God for a specific day of the year. He says, don't come in at all times. Within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. In Hebrew, that's ba'anan era'e al hakaporet. You see my wedding band? That's what's inscribed on my wedding band. In the cloud, I will appear upon the mercy seat. It's inscribed in Hebrew. And immediately following that phrase in Hebrew is the cross. Because you have to come in with the blood. And in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews tells us the blood that is offered upon the mercy seat of heaven is the blood of Christ. You cannot come into the presence of God unless you have the blood. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's quoted in Hebrews and we are specifically told it's a foreshadowing of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 9, the Apostle Paul, whom I believe wrote the book of Hebrews, writes, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot of manna and Aaron's rod that budded in the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubim of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. That is, into the holy place, that first compartment. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year. Here are two guys trying to do it. And look at the next phrase. Not without blood which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people the Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as yet the first tabernacle was standing which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience it was only temporary it covered sin Kippur from Kafar means a covering. It didn't do away with sin, it only covered sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from sin, it doesn't just cover it. Which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of redemption. But Christ, being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. That first one was only a figure, that's what he said. 
But Christ came into the greater, more perfect tabernacle. And he came in neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. And how I love verse 14. How many times you've heard me say this one. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. What have you got on your conscience? What have you got on your conscience? What is it that the devil reaches back into your past and he grabs hold of it and he drags it up and sticks it in your face and says, you see, you can't serve Jesus. Look at what you did. And he sneers at you. The blood of Christ not only cleanses your sin, it purges your conscience from dead works. Why? So that you can serve the living God. Christ came into the world to save sinners. The devil doesn't want you to remember that. Christ came to save sinners. And if he's going to save sinners and use sinners, he not only has to forgive their sins, but he cleanses by his blood, according to Hebrews 9.14, he cleanses their consciences so that they can serve the living God. We're talking about Yom Kippur. That's the context that he's dealing with here. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that is, under the law, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Verse 16. For where a testament is, that is a covenant, that's the word for a covenant, there must also of necessity, it's not an option, there also must of necessity be the death of the testator. Now most of you out here have a will written, or as they used to call them, a last will and testament, because it not only was a will as to what was going to happen to your material junk, but it was a testament of your faith. When I write a Christian will, I don't just call it on the cover sheet, will. I call it last will and testament because I only do these for believers. And I help them articulate a testament of faith of the very first article under their last will and testament. Because what you pass on spiritually to your children and your grandchildren and all those who will read it in the future, the probate judge, the clerks of the probate judge, anybody who happens to be doing research, genealogical research, or wanting to find out something about the history of your family, will read that, your testament of faith. It's important for you to have it in there, a last will and testament. But you know, you can have it in your safe, or you can have it in the safe deposit box at the bank, and it doesn't take effect until what happens? You have to die. And for us to get the eternal inheritance, just like for you to get the temporal inheritance, the testator has to die. That's what Yom Kippur is all about. That's the fast that we're dealing with in our text. The testator must die. Where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, for a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats and water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament, the covenant, which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. 
There is no sending away of sin. That was something else that happened on Yom Kippur. There were two goats. One goat was called the Lord's goat. That was the goat that was slain. A bullock was also slain, a very special reason, we'll see that in a moment. But of the two goats, one was killed and the other one, the priest placed his hands, the high priest placed his hands upon the head of that second goat, which was called the scapegoat, and placed all the sins of the people on that goat. And then an able-bodied man would take it into the wilderness and drive it far, far away so that it would never, ever come back. Both those goats symbolize the Lord Jesus Christ. The goat that was slain symbolized the death of Christ on Calvary's cross. We're told that in the book of Hebrews. But the second goat also portrayed the beautiful picture for us that our sins being placed on Christ are taken from us as far as the east is from the west. No more to be remembered against us. This is Yom Kippur, the fast. This is Paul's background. As he sails out, the fast just having passed. He says that sails out into the seas of danger. He knows there's danger. He senses it. But there's a popular vote that takes place. There's a leader who decides to believe somebody who he thinks is in the know. And it almost costs them all their lives. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of these things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Now here we go. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself. That's where the original tabernacle is of which the earthly tabernacle was only a shadow, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he have offered and often have suffered since the foundation of the world. How often does Yom Kippur take place? It takes place once a year, once a year. Almost for 3,500 years, Yom Kippur has been taking place with the Jewish people. Nearly 3,500 Yom Kippurs. Because the blood of bulls and goats can never permanently take away sin, it can only cover. That's the point that he's making. Not yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. As I said this morning, that's one of the reasons why we're Protestants and not Catholics. When the priest offers up the Mass and says in the words of the Mass, we offer unto you the only true and living God, he elevates the host, that is the goblet with the wine in it and the wafer on top of it, symbolizing the body and blood of Christ. He's telling the people that he has the supernatural power to transubstantiate the host. Since Christ is the host, this is now Christ. Although the same in appearance, yet transformed in substance. That's why it's called transubstantiation. And that when they partake of that, they're actually partaking of Christ. And so it's called the sacrifice of the Mass, which goes on perpetually as the world turns and as the priest is getting up each morning and offering this sacrifice, Jesus is being perpetually sacrificed over and over and over again. How many times does the book of Hebrews say that Jesus had to be sacrificed because he made an infinite sacrifice for our sins? Once, once, it emphasizes it three times. 
Back to our text in Leviticus. So I gave you the first two verses out of Leviticus 16. And then I showed you where it's found over in the book of Hebrews as it points to Christ. Now in Leviticus 16.3. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat. You see, there are lots of steps that have to be gone through. Nadab and Abihu didn't follow it all. They got killed. He shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh. He shall be girded with a linen girdle. Linen mitre shall be attired. These are the holy garments. There were two of them, by the way, and not just one. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so shall he put them on. Now, here are the key offerings in verses 5 and 6. He shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Three animals here. Those offerings relate specifically to the congregation. But then in verse 6, he has to take a really big animal because it's for him. Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. Those in positions of authority are always held to a greater standard of accountability. Before any person ever takes a leadership office in a church, he should understand that he will be held to a higher standard of accountability and it may cost him a great deal more than these other offerings which were for the whole people. Verse 7, here's what happens to the two goats. We're told about the ram later, but it says, He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat, that is, he's escaping, into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself and shall make an atonement for himself in his house, shall kill the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself. Ah, now listen to verse 12, because here is part of where they went wrong, Nadab and Abihu. You know, I'm making application of this to us, folks. He shall take a censer full of burning coals from off the fire of the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it within the veil. The only one who was supposed to go in was who? The high priest. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, that he die not. Then it goes on and talks about sprinkling the blood of the bullock with his finger seven times. Talking about the killing of the goat for the sin offering and what he does with that. And then the scapegoat in verse 21 Aaron lays his hands on the head of the live goat, confesses over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and he shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness, and the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. And we're told when this will happen, down in verse 29, this shall be a statute forever unto you, that is, in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, Ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or of a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest. It's one of the special Sabbaths that God ordained. And you shall afflict your souls by a statute. Get the next two words. For ever every year remembrance was made of sin every year for 3,500 years now the Jews remember sin remember what we just read over in Hebrews 914 how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. 
Jesus blots out our sins. Jesus washes away our sins. Jesus cleanses us from sin. He doesn't merely cover it over, sweep it under the rug, and make us go through that again year after year after year after year after year after year. After year. Jesus died once for our sins. You understand why the Apostle Paul could be relaxed on his journey. He's just been through Yom Kippur in Jerusalem. He knows that it's all over. He doesn't have to do it again because Jesus has paid for his sins. So in the will of God, no matter what happens to him, he knows that he is right with God. Verse 34, This shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, let's contrast to Shabbat. That's a day of mourning practiced by the Jews in remembrance for all the horrible things that happened to them, beginning with the destruction of the first temple, the Temple of Solomon. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it on the ninth of Av. This year, the Shabbat fell on August 13th. We've just gone past it. You may have heard it in the news, August 13th. But it's not a festival that was commanded by God. It's a memorial established by the Jews to see how many things have happened to them, these horrible things, and they remember them all, believe me, they remember them all, all the horrible things that have happened to the Jews over the centuries. It's also a day of fasting, but it's not one of the festivals of Israel ordained by God. Let me read you some of the horrible things that have fallen on that day or very near to that day. The ninth day of the Hebrew month Av is a day of great sadness and mourning for the Jewish people. This year the solemn observance began at sundown on the 13th. This date marks the destruction of both the first temple by Nebuchadnezzar, and it was on that exact same day that the second temple was destroyed by the Romans. On that same day in 132 AD, there was a great massacre of Jewish people by the Roman soldiers as they crushed the Bar Kokhba revolt, son of the Tsar. I'm sure some of you have heard of Bar Kokhba. Let me read you some of the other events that have either occurred on the 9th of Av or very close to the 9th of Av. The Jews were expelled from England on July 18th, 1290. That was the 9th of Av in the Jewish year 5050. The Jews were expelled from France on July 22nd, 1306. That was the 10th of Av in 5066. The Jews were expelled from Spain on July 31st in 1492. That was the 7th of Av in 5252 in the Jewish calendar. They date from creation. On August 2nd, 1941, that was the 9th of Av in the year 5701 on the Jewish calendar. August 2nd, 1941, SS Commander Heinrich Himmler formally received approval from the Nazi party for the final solution. Almost one third of the Jewish population of the world were captured and killed by the time World War II ended. On July 23rd, 1942, that was the 9th of Av in the year 5702 on the Jewish calendar, the mass deportation of Jews began from the Warsaw Ghetto en route to the death camps at Treblinka. The AMIA bombing of the Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires, killing 85 and injuring 300, took place on July 18, 1994. That was the 10th of Av in the Jewish year 5,700 and 54. You understand why the Jewish people keep this as a day of mourning, the saddest day of the year for the Jewish people. With all that in mind, and Paul being a Jew, with the Day of Atonement ingrained in his soul and just passed, the memory of the destruction of the first temple on Tisha B'Av, with the second temple of Herod soon to be destroyed, of course, on that exact same day, now, pause to think of those 20 questions that we asked last week. Have you ever felt like your life is sailing through dangerous waters? Have you felt like there are scary things around you you can't control in your life? Have you felt that other people around you are making decisions that affect you and you can't do anything about it? Have you ever felt like you're sailing really slowly and want to pick up the pace, want to see some action, want to see a change of scenery or get out of a dangerous situation? 
Have you ever gotten bored with the dullness of your life? Have you ever felt like your life is just dragging along? Do you feel like you're trudging uphill in the mud, not making any progress toward the goals that you've set for yourself? Do you like to organize and try to control what's going on in your life, but it's not happening? Do you like to try to control the lives of other people and make them do what you want to do so that you can make your life easier? Do you feel like nothing is working no matter what you do? Do you have a hollow feeling in your gut that every plan that you make fails miserably? Do you have a sense that every time you invest your energy, time, and resources in something, it falls flat? Have you ever been frustrated like you're spinning your wheels, getting no traction, wasting time, even though you hate wasting time? Have you ever felt like you're giving it everything that you've got, but nothing is happening? Have you ever done your best and gotten no praise for a job well done, like people just look at you and shrug their shoulders or laugh when you fall flat on your face? Then think about Shab Av and Yom Kippur. The contrast that I just gave to you. Which one of them do you think of more frequently? Do you think of yourself in the context of Tisha B'Av, where all these horrible things have happened to you, and you're blaming everybody else, and you remember it, and you mourn, and groan, and complain? Or do you think Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, it happened for 3,500 years, up to today. But after 1,500 years, it was fulfilled in Jesus. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience? Not bring it up year after year after year after year. The devil tries to do that. He grabs your conscience. He slams those things into your face. You remember when you did this? You remember when you did this? And you melt. How much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. He's called us not merely to be saved. He's called us to serve. The Apostle Paul understood that. That's why we see him at perfect peace as he goes through these situations. When you feel like that, remember the three things that we gave you, three essential principles so that you can trust in the sovereignty of God. Number one, God can do it without you. Because his purpose in your life is not merely to see how much stuff you can accomplish. Number two, God's primary purpose in your life is to conform you to the image of Christ. And God controls principle number three, the entire universe with total precision to make sure that all of the elements, all of the events, all of the heavenly creatures, all of the angels and demons, all of the people he has created on the planet and provide the exact precise setting with whom you come in contact to accomplish his purpose for your life to his own glory and the glory of his son, Jesus Christ. And we know, Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Sailing slow after fast? Remember that contrast. Where do you focus? Do you focus on all the horrible events in life, just like the Jews have focused on all of those events on the Shab Av? Well, they still celebrate Yom Kippur. But you know, the Jews today call Shab Av the saddest day of the year because they focus on all the bad things that have happened to them. And indeed, bad things have happened to them. Instead of focusing on the fact that God has provided the lamb for the sacrifice so that their sins are forgiven. God has given them their Messiah. God has given them Jesus. But he's given Jesus for us as Gentiles too. We are also made nigh by the blood of Christ. We've also been brought into the great plan and blessings of God because the lamb without blemish shed his blood and it has been sprinkled upon the true altar and in the true tabernacle of heaven once never to be repeated again and it not only forgives your sins 
but it cleanses your conscience. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the great and precious promises of your word. How it makes us understand why the Apostle Paul really had no fear for himself. How he could sail into the dangerous waters even knowing what lay ahead but only had concern for others. People who only thought about their own comfort and convenience. They thought it would be nicer if they could get to some really nice place to spend the winter months in and didn't know that it almost cost them their life. Father, help us not to be people who focus on the ninth of Av, upon the things in life which are all those negative things, all the horrible things that have happened to us. Help us instead to focus on Yom Kippur, the lamb has been slain. Our sins have been placed on the scapegoat and driven away from us as far as the east is from the west. No more to be remembered against us. That we have genuine forgiveness and cleansing by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn tonight 